Comedy and suspense are two genres that should be like oil and water. How could the two possibly mix? Somehow, the menu pulls it off. The characters are familiar but heightened to a point nearing caricature, stopping just short of shattering the movie's reality. The food critic reaches for things to criticize rather than just enjoy a meal. The washed out movie star puts on airs hoping to reclaim lost glory, and Tyler is a poser who intellectually understands the composition of food but can't partake in the art. Through the eyes of outsider Margot, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, we laugh at these self-serious characters while hoping that she, and to some extent the rest of the cast, make it out alive. The end result? The menu has you gripping your armrests as much as it has you laughing out loud. And much of that laughter has its roots in satire. But given the eclectic cast of characters and a couple of other factors, sometimes it's hard to track exactly where that satire is pointed in the movie's underlying message. To go any further, we have to get into spoilers, so consider this your spoiler warning. On the surface, the movie points its satire at foodie culture. In part, that's due to the movie's discovery process. One of the writers, Will Tracy, had the idea while sitting in an upscale restaurant located on a private island. When he watched the boat pull away from shore, he realized he was trapped there until the end of the meal, and his mind started to wonder, what if? But the setting didn't just make for good suspense, it also happened to be the perfect fit to highlight places where culture has gone awry. Between Netflix, TikTok, Instagram, and hmm, can't really think of any other content platforms. Anyway, between all of them, so much of our culture now centers around content consumption. And if you want to consider that topic, what better choice than food culture where the content is literally consumed and where the art is, as Chef Julian Slowick points out, turned into something else when digested in the body. At the start of the movie, the cast of characters are brought into the chef's world, totally under his command. And like the children who entered Willy Wonka's factory, each of their sins are slowly revealed. It doesn't take long for us to realize and for the movie to explicitly tell us everyone is going to die. So the rest of the movie really asks two questions. Thematically, why is everyone, including the chef himself, deserving of punishment? And to maintain plot momentum and suspense, will Margot survive? To the first question, there are a number of sins to mention, but one of the most important, which highlights both sides, creator and consumer, is embodied by Tyler's character, because the chef uses him to show how art is degraded into content. One of the most important aspects of art is its ability to evoke powerful feelings to move us. When Chef Slowick began his career, that's what he was doing. But like a magic trick, once you expose how it's done and break it down to its logical components, the feeling is gone. That's what Tyler and other foodies have done to the chef's craft. Slowick points it out himself. Tyler has turned eating into an intellectual exercise, identifying every ingredient and process involved in creating the food, rather than simply enjoying it. The way a critic might watch a movie, looking for every technique, plot point, pro and con, rather than getting lost in the story and feeling whatever they may feel. Tyler certainly emulates enjoyment by moaning and making the faces one makes when enjoying a meal, but it's all an act, proven when he quote-unquote enjoys the dish of accompaniments without bread. He swallows up spoonfuls of olive oil with a smile, missing that he's the butt of the joke. Once art becomes content, it enters a transactional ecosystem. On one end, you have the creator, and on the other, you have a room of people looking to use that content to their own ends. The critic turns the experiences into reviews and power, to cast judgment, to make or break careers. The finance bros are part of the investment machine behind the content. The washed up actor looks to say he's friends with a famous chef. The wealthy couple just need a way to spend their money as only the rich can. And Tyler, who can't stop himself taking pictures, wants to make sure people know that he's eating the very best. The chef also points out that 
Not only has Tyler robbed himself of an artistic experience, but he and his ilk have created such demand for the food, its price has been artificially inflated, to a point where only the wealthy can afford it, meaning the only people who will taste the chef's food are the people who won't be able to fully appreciate it. People who are already accustomed to luxury, people who, rather than taste, will instead identify, critique, or just use the meal as a status symbol. Art has always been a subjective experience. What's nothing to some may be art to others. But if we believe Chef Slowick, his art has been stripped of its power, and even its subjective nature is worthless because its audience has been relegated to the likes of Tyler. Further, although the movie doesn't explicitly say this, there's something uncomfortable about turning food into art. It's something people need to survive, and some struggle to get enough of it to live. Yet this room of people are so comfortable in their station, they can take a necessity and turn it into a status symbol. The subjectivity couldn't be made clearer than by Margot, true name Erin, in her final victory by Cheeseburger. You can imagine how Chef Slowick and Tyler would scoff at a cheeseburger, ground beef, American cheese, and cooked medium of all things. But that cheeseburger is the only food truly enjoyed by anyone in the menu's runtime. Taste is clearly in the mouth of the beholder. Throughout the movie, it's ultimately Chef Slowick who hands out the punishments. So he becomes the movie's mouthpiece for satire. So to know the sins that make his patrons deserving of punishment, we only need to hear what he has to say. One of the main themes of his complaints is entitlement. Just look at his treatment of Felicity. When the question of her fate is raised, he asks what school she went to, Brown, and whether or not she used student loans, no. In one of the movie's more on-the-nose jokes, he quickly concludes, yeah, you're dying. The implication being that she attended an Ivy League school on someone else's dime. In 2022, she's a walking stereotype of entitlement. And of course, there's a sense of entitlement in every character, aside from Aaron, who believes themselves deserving of the fine delicacies so few can afford. In the finance bros, we see entitlement in their attitude that they essentially own Chef Slowick and his staff because they invested in the restaurant. They demand bread when the chef serves a dish whose point is that it comes without it, and they try to wield their power to stop Slowick from killing them. But, of course, their entitlement proves false, because they're just as trapped as everyone else. You might say, that's not fair. As investors, they should have some say, and obviously, they're not deserving of execution. Well, you can't take the deaths too seriously, because we are in the realm of satire, and that's partly why the characters are written as stereotypes bordering on caricature. Otherwise, the movie would be far too disturbing and alienate some of the audience the writers hope to reach. But to the first question of, shouldn't the investors have a say? The answer is yes. The fact is, Chef Slowick has a point, but he's also part of the problem. He chooses to make the food he makes, and he chooses to participate in the system. For there to be content, there has to be a content creator. But we also see that Slowick accepts his role because neither he nor his staff are spared the final dish, execution by s'mores. It's an important point that's often forgotten. In every supposedly evil system of creation and consumption, there have to be two sides. If, for example, you scoff at clickbaity thumbnails and titles, remember that people make them because they work. You're all the ones clicking on them. You know, if you don't want me to put red arrows all over my thumbnail, maybe try clicking on my normal thumbnails that we put a lot of work into. Uh, anyway, where were we? Chef Slowick is the example of a fact that's often true. The people complaining about a broken system are part of that very system. Whether on the consumer side or creator side, they are a necessary part without whom the system would fail. Even that has a sense of entitlement to it. Slowick wants to participate in the foodie system where he knows the customer base and he knows what they're really buying, yet he wants to create art. 
It's the equivalent of reneging on a transaction. The people pay for content, Slovak takes their money, and when they demand that content, he complains. Co-writer Seth Rice said this about how audiences feel toward the chef. I think in some ways they agree with his evening and why he's doing what he's doing, but then ultimately I think people feel, oh, stop whining. You've chosen to do this with your life. You need to accept that this is what your vocation is, like I've accepted what my vocation is. Calm down. Ultimately, he's just as guilty as the rest of them, and clearly, he knows it. Though, he also knows the power he wields. One side effect of content creation culture is that people gain a following, and with it, tremendous influence. Totalitarian or authoritarian countries often use mass media to promote their leader. They control the public by force when necessary, but it's so much easier when the masses voluntarily subject themselves to the leader's rule. And that can be accomplished by a cult of personality, essentially brainwashing. Through non-stop positive coverage, the audience is hypnotized into trusting and looking up to the ruler so they don't need to be forced into obedience, they choose it. Whether by accident or by design, a similar phenomenon occurs where content creators become influencers. In the menu, that's Chef Slowick. His staff clearly treat him like the leader of a cult. They respond to him loudly and in unison. They speak of him as almost a deity, only calling him chef, and never referring to him by name. They kill for him, and they die for him, as we first saw with Jeremy, the worker who will never be as good as Slowick, who kills himself in front of the patrons. Tyler is also a good representation of his followers. He will do whatever the chef says no matter how preposterous. He'll enjoy a dish of bread accompaniments without bread. He'll bring a hapless victim to die just so he can participate in the meal, something we learn later in the film. Tyler knew they would all die and only brought Margot because the event required a plus one. He knew she would die, but brought her anyway. And as we saw, he will die for the chef. We don't hear what Slowick whispers to Tyler, but afterward, he walks off and hangs himself. Though it's important to note that, even without the chef's command, suicide was a distinct possibility for Tyler. The chef humiliated him by putting him on the spot and finally giving him a chance to cook. But in front of everyone, Tyler proves what everyone already knew. Tyler can name every technique and ingredient, but for the life of him, he can't cook. So he fails, and the chef tells him so. The look on Tyler's face tells you everything you need to know. His spirit has been utterly destroyed. That is the power of a cult leader. That's the power of an influencer. They control the emotions of their followers and can lead them to self-destructive or just plain destructive actions. Aside from Tyler, no one else knew their fate coming into the restaurant. He was the only one Chef Slowick could tell because he was the only real fanatic among them. But at a certain point, the rest clearly accept their fate. They hardly attempt to escape, something the chef points out himself. He even points out that if they seriously tried, they probably could have escaped. So he tells them to ask themselves why they didn't. It seems that some did ask the question and realize the answer. The chef is right. They deserve their fate. That's evidenced by the look Erin gets when she's finally allowed to leave. She turns back for a moment, and Anne, the rich businessman's wife, gestures for her to leave. One interpretation of that gesture is, you deserve to live, we don't, so go on ahead and don't worry about us. But it's not just that they think they deserve to lose their lives, they also just don't see that they have lives worth living. We see it clearly with Chef Slowick. His life has become devoid of any joy. He doesn't just deserve to die, he wants to. And although it isn't said explicitly, I think it can be read that the patrons feel the same way. The message being, when all you chase are status symbols and all you do is bask in entitlement, rather than work hard to earn something or create something meaningful, your life is empty. Throughout the movie, we see that none of the characters have meaningful relationships. When the finance bros talk, they offhand mention deteriorating relationships with their significant others, but cheer to how much they're crushing it at work. 
The photo tortilla reveals the older businessman, Richard Lee Brandt, has been secretly dining with another woman, who turns out to be Margot, hired as an escort. And later we find out that he asked her to say she's his daughter while he touched himself. This may imply he used to have an inappropriate relationship with his now deceased daughter, and he's reliving those memories through Margot. We eventually realize that Tyler and Margot are not a couple, but she was only hired as a way for Tyler to meet the plus one requirement. John Leguizamo's character George has a relationship with his assistant Felicity, but it's clear she's just using him and even admits she's been stealing from him. And the food critic's editor, Ted, is clearly a sycophant, just telling Lillian what she wants to hear to stay on her good side. All of their relationships are meaningless. Even if you consider the friendship between the bros, you find it's empty. When they're given a chance to run for their lives, there's no semblance of working together to escape. Immediately, each one is out for themselves, yelling at the other when they get too close, possibly drawing the attention of their captors. The bottom line is that the movie paints each of their pursuits as empty and meaningless. Investors committing fraud for financial gain, a food critic wielding power to deem what is good or bad, and to make or break the careers of chefs and restaurateurs. A wealthy couple eating delicacies just as a way to spend money, but without taking a moment to truly appreciate the food. A washed up actor just looking for fame at any cost and so on. And all this isn't just to further the point that these are sins deserving of some kind of punishment. The point is that it's not just external judgment we should fear. It's not just some vague sense that karma will get you if your pursuits are impure. It's that the pursuits themselves are actually self-destructive. They lead to an empty existence. So these characters, when that truth is laid bare, they accept their fate. The menu was one of the most enjoyable theatrical experiences I've had in a few months. Not just because it had something to say, but because it was able to use satire without undercutting actual tension. It pushed its characters to the limits of caricature and stereotype, but the cast took their performances seriously. They felt real enough to create suspense, while reminding us that this is a black comedy. It's okay to laugh while everyone is dying. It's an impressive feat, and one deserving of all the critical acclaim the movie is getting. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you check out the rest of my What Blank Is Really About series, where I've covered The Green Knight, The Shining, Blade Runner, and more. Let me know in the comments if there are other movies you want to see me cover in this series, and of course, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more. With that, thank you for watching, and see you on the next one take.